All right, folks, we're just about ready to begin. I'd like to thank you for taking your seat at this time. And if you're in the back and you want to upgrade your seat, we have a lot of seats on the side near the wall here, up near the front, as well as uh, in the wall next to the exit. Don't be shy. Get a good seat now. And uh, thank you very much. My name is Charlie Brennan. I'm with uh, KMOX Radio and KETC's Donnybrook. Been 26 years with KMOX. As Mark Twain said, if you send a damn fool to St. Louis and you don't tell them that he's a damn fool, they'll never find out. <laughs> and so that explains my quarter century there. And also with Donnybrook, does anybody by chance watch that program Thursday nights? Absolutely. Okay, great. Well, thank you. For those of you who haven't watched Donnybrook, let me just explain to you, uh, every Thursday night at 7 o'clock, five guys, actually five of us, four guys, one woman, sit around a green table, 7 o'clock on Channel 9, and for 30 minutes, four of them listen to Ray Hartman. <laughs> okay. So now you know. Yes. Martin Dugan is uh, living down the street, as a matter of fact. He moved, and he and May are... Uh, not too far from where we are right now. So any other questions before we begin? <laughs> Usually this is when the creditors come up with some sort of subpoena or something. Hey, it's my pleasure to be here tonight as we all welcome our distinguished and renowned guest speaker, Michael Hinkson, who's with us tonight. <clears throat> He's here from San Francisco, probably a Giants fan. Am I right? Dodgers. Oh, Dodgers. <laughs> First, first, foremost, and always, a Dodgers fan. Dodgers, Dodgers, first, foremost, and always. No question about it. Best announcer in baseball. I know some St. Louis people like, but that's okay. Oh, you're saying Vin Scully's the best. Oh, uh, well, it's very nice to see you uh, be on your way, sir. <laughs> you know, there was a Dodger. Uh, there was a time in 1944. You probably know this at the Lindell Towers on Lindell. You, do you remember that? Well... I read about it, Michael. Okay. And, uh, of course, that was the Streetcar World Series when the Browns right. played the Cardinals in the World Series. And what was interesting about that, I thought, was that both managers lived in the same apartment, not apartment building, same apartment in the Lindell Towers on Lindell. That would be Luke Sewell of the Browns, Billy Southworth of the Cardinals. And it worked well during the season because when the Browns were in town, the Cardinals were on the road and vice versa. The problem arose during the World Series when both teams were in St. Louis. So as it turns out, the Sewells moved out. The Southworths stayed in the apartment building. Sewells found another apartment within the Lindell Towers. And, uh, but they say that in 2006 that Jim Leland and Tony La Russa were really close when those two managers met in the World <laughs> Series. Not as close as these two because they drove home together during, after each of the six games of that World Series, okay? But also in that apartment building was uh, the husband of Grace DeRocher, who was a clothing executive in town. Leo DeRocher, manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers, lived in the same apartment building. And after the two of them split, he got married three times, their dining room set ended up at St. Helwig Parish in South St. Louis. When that closed, Monsignor Sudicum of Our Lady of Lords took it, and it's now... Leo DeRocher's furniture, you Dodgers fan, is at Our Lady of Lords Rectory on Forsyth in University City. So before you head back to San Francisco, you'll have to take a look at that. St. Louis has lots of baseball history, and that's as good as it gets. Well, one other story about DeRocher. 30, 1934, Cardinals were in a pennant race, last week of the season, and what does DeRocher decide to do? I bet you know this, Michael. He gets married at 10 o'clock in the morning in the Civil Courts building in downtown St. Louis. The Cardinals were a game out that morning. They lost that afternoon game. Frankie Fritsch, the yeah. manager of the team, said, can you imagine a guy like that getting married the last week of the season during a pennant race? But the Cardinals went on to win the pennant and the World Series that year. All right. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Well, anyway, later today we're going to hear Michael's harrowing, moving story that promises to leave each of us with the awe that true courage can inspire. I'm also pleased this evening to be here to celebrate the mutual efforts of two truly outstanding educational organizations, Character Plus, a resource of Education Plus, 
which was initiated and founded by Sanford McDonald to restore character to our students, as well as the Special Education Foundation, helping students with disabilities succeed in areas not covered by tax dollars. Their mutual endeavors strengthen character development in our schools, they build leadership schools in youth with special needs, and the two organizations strengthen the instructional foundation critical for successful schools. Before I introduce our first speaker, I'd like to recognize our sponsors who made this evening possible. From Brinkman Constructors, Larry Lipinski is in the room. Where are you, Larry? There he is. Thanks a lot, Larry. From Vantage Credit Union, Dr. Jerry Eichholz, board president. Doctor, thank you. Tomacek and Brink, another sponsor, Bo Tomacek and Jim Tomacek are in the house tonight. Thank you so much. From Mercer, Mary Jo Viviano. Where are you, Mary Jo? Oh, they're right in front. Thank you. Dr. Don Senti from the Education Plus, where he's executive director in the back of the room. Hey, Don. I'd also like to recognize Diane Burr, the Executive Director of the Special Education Foundation. <laughs> Diane. Other special guests tonight include John Carey, the Superintendent of the Special School District. Good to see you. Jan Goodman, Vice President of the Special School District Board of Education. Jan? Not here yet. When she walks in, we will all say, hi, Jan, okay? <laughs> board members of Character Plus and Special Education Foundation, can you by chance raise your hands if you're on the board of either? Thank you very much for your service. Thank you. Give yourselves a round of applause. Also with us tonight, Diane Klein, who is the Executive Director of Character Plus. Hey, Diane. Sherry Wenner, Chief Marketing and Development Officer of Education Plus. All right, Sherry. And now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, my friend Jerry Daniels, a member of the Executive Advisory Board of Character Plus and the retired president and CEO of Boeing Military Aircraft. Let's give it up, ladies and gentlemen, for Jerry Daniels. Thank you. Thank you all. You know, when Diane asked me to do that, she, she failed to mention a few things, like I was going to be squeezed in between Charlie, Gene McNary, and a professional speaker. So, uh, so bear with me, because I, I built airplanes for a living, and I, we, we can tell stories about that later. But uh, no, thank you all. Thank you all very much for being here. And I, too, would like to, uh, to say a special thanks to all of our sponsors. And, uh, you know, and if, speaking for Character Plus, we are... We're really honored to be able to co-chair this event with the uh, Special Education Foundation and, uh, and the magnificent work that they do for the special school district. And a little bit later, we're gonna hear an inspiring story from Michael. And you know, I think we're gonna hear a lot about perseverance and teamwork. And if I can just tell you a little bit about Character Plus, those happen to be two of the character traits that we hope to develop in young people. And as Charlie mentioned, you know, Character Plus was founded in 1988 by my old boss and friend and mentor, Sandy McDonald. And, uh, and, and his vision was that we would have generation after generation of young people who would not only achieve their dreams academically, but would develop into men and women of character and, and take their rightful place in our society. And thanks to the hard work of Diane, I swear it's Linda McKay. Linda, Linda in the back there, Liz Gibbons is not here tonight. Those have been the only three uh, that I know of, directors of, of, of Character Plus and a wonderful staff. Uh, today, Character Plus touches some 330,000 students in 75 different school districts. But you know, to me, I was always kind of a results-oriented data guy. The, the more important data is we know that the schools who have adopted Character Plus and made it part of their culture, those kids, not only do we reduce the number of behavioral disciplinary issues like bullying, but the academic performance goes up right with it. So thanks to people like you, for others, your donations, your support, Believe me, your money is working. It's doing what it intended to do. 
Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Charlie. Well, now there's a good pool player because he says he's not a great speaker and then look what he just did without notes, huh? Yeah, uh-huh, right. Thank you, Jerry. It's now my pleasure to introduce my friend Gene McNary, board president for Special Education Foundation, former St. Louis County executive and former commissioner of immigration and naturalization for President George Herbert Walker Bush. Gene will give us a brief overview of the Special Education Foundation and also introduce our distinguished spe speaker, Mr. Michael Hinson. Ladies and gentlemen, a nice warm welcome for Mr. G. McNary. Thanks, Gene. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, my thanks to all of you for being here and to our sponsors. Uh, we appreciate all your uh, support. Uh, I didn't know that this was going to start off as a baseball discussion, or I would have been better prepared. I was actually there in 1944 for the World Series. I didn't see any of those guys that you talked about. Now, I'm, I'm happy to say I missed the 1934 World Series, uh, but I heard a lot about them. I believe that um, each of us will come away enriched uh, after tonight's uh, story related by Michael Henson. His presence here tonight is actually the result of uh, my wife, Susan, wherever she is, over there. Over there. She, uh, she's gainfully employed. <laughs> and so I wave goodbye to her in the morning. And I go to the conferences with her. And so there was a conference in uh, Portland, Oregon on risk management, and just by stroke of good fortune, we dropped in to hear this speaker who happened to be Michael Henson. And we were both uh, surprised, inspired, uh, and could not believe that this man uh, could uh, have this story and this message. And so um, there's, there's no greater opportunity for our kids with uh, special needs to know what uh, a man can do who, who is uh, facing the challenges that he faced, and our kids face those challenges. Um, I wish we had all of them here so that, and, and many of them will be there tomorrow night because uh, uh, he's going to speak before the Fred Psy uh, youth leadership program, and that's a 10-year reunion. Uh, we've had 15 to 20 kids each year that have come from the high schools, and so there should be 150, 200 people there, and uh, they're, they're special. Uh, to us, they're very special. The foundation is a not-for-profit organization whose mission is to help children with disabilities achieve success in areas not supported by tax dollars. We call that outside the classroom. The foundation works with the staff of the special school district to provide scholarships, hearing aids, summer camps, arts in classroom, equipment for those with physical challenges, many grants for special education teachers, and it's my goal, even though <laughs> Diane gets nervous, when I talk about my goals, the teachers, the teachers are very creative, very have the initiative and the incentive. You can't believe these programs uh, that they come up with. We think that we can actually facilitate a laboratory for, and we've done it for a long time. We've recognized the teachers, but we have not really promulgated all of the good ideas that they've had. We think we can be a laboratory and spread those ideas uh, to other areas of the region and throughout the United States. That, that's what makes Diane a little tired. <laughs> uh, we've had high school leadership programs, student recognition, social skills, and parent support. The foundation was a fledgling. Uh, Ten years ago, we had a $50,000 budget. Uh, we now have a $500,000 annual budget, and uh, before I'm finished, we're gonna have a 
million dollar budget, and that also makes Diane a little bit tired. <clears throat> Foundation's growth is a result of teamwork. The teamwork is reflected in our partnership this evening with Character Plus. We think that we can join with them and, and make uh, even greater progress. And it is this powerful, valued lesson of teamwork that served as the cornerstones of Michael Henson's message tonight. We remember, that you probably can remember where you were um, during uh, the tragedy and horror of 9-11. It's a day none of us will ever forget, but perhaps no one remembers it quite like Michael Henson. Michael's life changed dramatically on that fateful day when he and his guide dog, Roselle, escaped and led others to safety from the 78th floor of Tower One in the World Trade Center, moments before it collapsed. Soon after, Michael and Roselle were thrust into the international limelight, where Michael began to share his unique survival story and the 9-11 lessons of trust, courage, heroism, and teamwork. Since that time, he's become a nationally recognized expert on the strength and power of teamwork. Blind since birth, Michael is no stranger to challenges. He and his guide dog were originally banned from riding the school bus. His parents fought the system and won, the, won that battle and many others. That's before ADA. ADA came in under my president. That was Bush the first, just so you know. <laughs> Michael shocked his peers when he learned to ride a bicycle alone through the streets of Palmdale, California. Think about that. He has a master's degree in physics, has a successful 27-year career in high-tech computer sales and management, and is the author of a number one New York Times bestseller, Thunderdog. This is not Thunderdog. And it was, remember, it was Roselle with him, 9-11. Michael is president of the Michael Henson Group, lives with his wife, Karen, in Northern California. His wife, Africa, is with him. His <laughs> now you know why I'm a retired politician. <laughs> Holy mackerel. Well, that was that awful. His dog. <laughs> uh, it, that's his seventh guide dog, in any case. <laughs> It is my honor and privilege to present Michael Henson. So, Gene, now you understand the need for risk management. <laughs> Thank you, Gene. It's a real pleasure to be here. And uh, Charlie, um, gee, uh, anybody know why radio announcers have small hands? Ready? Yeah. Ready? Ready. We pause for station identification. OK. You know what the doctor said as he sewed himself up? Suit yourself up. But anyway. <laughs> I want you to meet my colleague, Africa. Come here, come on, come on, come on. There you go, good girl. This is Africa. Africa is, wave, good girl, yay. Africa is seven and a quarter and uh, has been my guide dog since November of 2008. I'm really happy to be able to be here and participate and help the efforts both of Character Plus and the Special Education Foundation. I'm really looking forward to speaking with all the kids tomorrow night. And as a public speaker, I've always regarded my best and favorite speeches as ones where I really do have the opportunity to speak with and not to, because I think that a successful speaker has to really be able to communicate and dialogue. And that means getting a chance to listen to everyone where I speak. So I, I really look forward to, and Diane has said that we'll have a chance to have questions later, so I get to hear from all y'all. That's how we say it, you know, in the South, it's all y'all. <laughs> I don't know whether that comes up here to this side of the Missouri Compromise, but okay. <laughs> 
So here's a question for you. What would you do if tomorrow you suddenly awaken and discover that you were blind? Or what would you do if some other life-altering thing happened to you? I mean, it's happened enough times in our country lately. Tornadoes struck Missouri, what, two years ago? Um, Hurricane Sandy, Hurricane Rita, um, all the different hurricanes around the country, all the different tragedies that we've had. And unfortunately, we mostly refer to tragedies and we remember the tragedies, but there are also the good things that happen to us. And the, the reality is that change, no matter what caused it, change is something that can be a negative or a positive depending on our choice as to how to address it. We can choose to become stronger from the negative changes. We can learn from them. We can learn from the positive changes because we want to keep those happening, of course. Change is all around us. And although people always say we've got to have change in our lives, the fact of the matter is we hate change when it comes down to it. <laughs> but change is what we make of it. And the reality is, what would you do tomorrow if you woke up to discover that you're blind? One thing that you could do is learn about blindness and learn how to deal with it. Because the reality is, blindness does not define me and should not define you if it happens to you. It's a characteristic that I have. It is something that is part of me, but it is not what defines me. What defines me is how I live my life, how I act in society, and how I choose to progress in the world. Blindness can be an asset to that in reality. The problem with our society, the problem with people in general is that all y'all think, see there we go again with that, <laughs> slipping back and I've been to the south, you see. The, the problem is that most of us think that eyesight is really the only game in town. If you can't see, you can't live. I can think we can carry that to other disabilities as well. But I specifically deal with blindness because the Gallup Polling Organization tells us that blindness, not disability, is one of the top five fears in this country. And blindness is feared by 76% of all people over any other disability. We think that eyesight is what we have to have in order to live. And the reality, yes, we make our world to be a sight-oriented thing, but eyesight is not the only game in town. And there are some things that I won't do as a blind person. I won't play football, <laughs> which any smart person would decide not to do anyway. I don't want to get those concussions and all that. Baseball might be a little tough, so Leo DeRocher and the Tony La Russa and all the folks there don't need to worry about me coming along and messing up some pitcher's ERA. But, but on the other hand, I can read in the dark. How many of you can do that? I mean truly read in the dark. Doesn't bother me one single bit. And as a blind person, I have the opportunity to learn to tune in and become very accustomed to my environment in ways that you won't. You can, but you won't. So people ask me all the time, how did you get around the World Trade Center? Who helped you out? The fact of the matter is, there were people who were helping me and I was helping other people, but how did I get around the World Trade Center and how did I get out? That was a team effort between me and my guide dog, Roselle. But it starts with me as the team leader. A lot of people say, oh, your guide dog led you out. I, I hear about it on reports on the news all the time when people cover me speaking somewhere. Guide dog led blind person out. Wrong. Yeah. Not the way it is. Guide dog does not lead blind person. Guide dog follows directions given by blind person. It is my responsibility to know where I want to go and how to get there. It's the dog's job to follow those directions and walk us and keep us safe. So if I'm on a sidewalk and we're walking along and suddenly the dog stops, I have to find out why. Now, there are a lot of different cues that give me that information. Things like 
we were walking along inside of a building and I could hear that we were walking along the side of a building. Suddenly that sound of being next to a building ends. We walk a few more feet, the dog stops, and there are cars going across in front of me. That tells me we're probably at a street corner. Hello, I don't need to see to know that. <laughs> Likewise, anything else that I do when I travel. The unfortunate thing is, all too often in our society, blind nor other persons with disabilities, no matter what, get the proper training. We don't get to learn the skills that we really need to have. And most of the time when we do, it's by people who don't truly, in their hearts, believe that we can live our lives and have the same capacity to function and thrive and survive as everyone else. Most of the people who train blind people, for example, and I don't, I'm going to talk about blindness, but it carries to all disabilities, but I kind of know a little bit more about blindness, you know? <laughs> I could talk about people in wheelchairs. My wife Karen is, is in a chair. She's been in a chair her whole life. It's a great marriage. We've been married over 31 years. We'll be married 32 years this November. Congratulations. We knew the marriage was going to last. We grew up in Southern California, and uh, we got married on November 27th, 1982. The church was supposed to be full, and the wedding was supposed to start at 4 o'clock, at 10 after 4, 11 after 4, 12 after 4. The church was less than half full. Suddenly the doors opened and everyone burst in and the wedding went on and all that. We didn't learn till later, loyal people waiting to see us marry, watch this. Later, we learned that everyone was out in their cars waiting for the end of the USC Notre Dame game. <laughs> I want to point out, I want to point out, God is a wonderful soul, USC beat Notre Dame. I was in a hotel a while ago and somebody said in the elevator going down, God's a Jesuit. I couldn't resist, I had to bite. Why do you say that? Because Boston College is beating Notre Dame 27 to 25. <laughs> okay. But in any case, it, it's a great marriage because Karen reads I push, works out really well. <laughs> so the, the fact is, though, that we mostly don't get the proper training because it isn't provided by people who truly have the conviction and the absolute certainty that we can truly do whatever we choose to do. In this world today, there are blind physicians. There is a blind brain surgeon. There are blind physicists. My master's degree is in physics. There are blind radio announcers. There's a blind guy who did color sports for one of the minor league baseball teams in North Carolina for years. There's a blind guy who climbed Mount Everest. And of course, there's blind people who escaped from the World Trade Center on 9-11. Because we, like you, can find ourselves in any circumstance, in any situation. And the fact of the matter is, that's as it should be. And we really do have the capacity. Eyesight or lack of it shouldn't be the determining factor. What should be the determining factor is our drives and the capability that we have and people encouraging us to reach our maximum real potential. And those are the kinds of things that I see happening in Character Plus and the Special Education Foundation, where people are truly encouraged to be leaders, to be innovative, to go out in the world and do everything that we can do. I said earlier, people always say to me, well, how'd you get out of the World Trade Center? Your dog led you out? Or what were you doing in the World Trade Center in the first place? Because after all, a blind person couldn't really do anything there. <laughs> And, and you know, it's, it's all pervasive. To give you an example of how all pervasive the attitudes or poor attitudes about blindness are, a week and a half ago we were in a store. Actually, my wife and I were in an Ikea store with some friends. <clears throat> so there we are, having eaten our Swedish meatballs, and now we're going around the store looking <laughs> at kitchens and so on, because we're going to be moving. Uh, my wife had an illness, and so we're moving to Southern California to get her closer to family. So we were looking at different kinds of kitchen designs and so on. But we're walking along in the store. I'm right behind the chair. She now uses a power chair, so I have to run. And 
And this young man, probably about 11 or 12, comes up and he says, I'm really sorry for you. That's the first thing out of his mouth. And I said, what? And he said, I'm sorry for you. And I said, well, why are you sorry for me? Because you're blind. I've seen that time and time again. And there are a lot of ways to respond, and probably I reacted a little bit stronger than I said, should have, but I said, you know, I'm sorry for you. And he said, well, why are you sorry for me? And I said, because you can't see and you don't know what it's like to be blind. And I don't expect any of you to understand fully what it's like to be blind or have a disability. It isn't necessary. I don't know how you all do the things that you do. I mean, I'm amazed. I think you guys do wonderfully for not using dogs or canes. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, it doesn't matter whether you know how I do it. Just like it shouldn't matter and it doesn't matter and people don't want it to matter that I don't know how you do it. I understand it on, a, on one level, but on another level there's no way to understand it. But it doesn't matter. What I do accept is, you can do it. And I expect and demand that that be the same thing that society gives me. Unfortunately, it doesn't always happen. For example, under the law right now, it is still okay for a company or organization to apply for an exemption so that they do not have to pay persons with disabilities minimum wage. There are people in this country with disabilities who are legally being paid as low as three cents an hour. And it is not against the law. That's unacceptable. That is not the way it should be. There are kids in school with guide dogs who are being denied access to, to all that the school has to offer, even though the Americans with Disabilities Act that, that did pass during George H.W. Bush's <laughs> time in office. God bless him for that. And so many people were to get passed. But even with the ADA, the ADA doesn't make life a lot better because we still have to fight every case in the courts. And that will happen until society truly accepts us for the capable human beings we are and recognizes that we have the same right to live in the world as everyone else. I worked in the World Trade Center on the 78th floor of Tower One. That's in a building that was 110 stories tall. 78 floors is pretty far up there. It is so high, here's a test, it is so high, any Johnny Carson shows? All right, we'll do it once more there. Uh, somebody got it. Okay, uh, everybody on three. It is so high, it is so high that on the 4th of July, people would come to our offices to look down on the fireworks displays in New York. I love that. Anyway, um, I worked there managing and directing an office for Quantum Corporation, a Fortune 500 company. On 9-11, we were going to be conducting some sales seminars, teaching some of our reseller partners how to sell our products. Suddenly at 8.45 in the morning, I'm assuming there are no blind people in the room? That's okay, I'll, assuming there might be, there's always that possibility. By the way, did Jan come in? <laughs> Darn, we don't get to say hi to Jan yet. Jan's here? Jan's here? Yes. Everybody on three. One, two, three. Hi, hi Jan. Jan. <laughs> it's going to hit me for that later, I'm sure. I just lost a friend. Or gained one. Amen. So, uh, we were there on the 78th floor getting ready to hold these seminars when at 8.45 in the morning I heard a muffled explosion. The building kind of shook and if you imagine my hand as the tower and I'm up moving it toward you. I said I was going to pretend there were blind people in the room. This is what the building did. It just started tipping and tipping and tipping. I had participated in fire drills, emergency evacuation procedures. I spent many hours walking around the World Trade Center to learn how to get around, to learn where everything was. In fact, 
after a while I had to work at getting lost and I wanted to get lost so that I could make sure that I truly learned how to get anywhere in the building and I learned all of the things that I needed to know to get me out because in my company most of the time my sales folks and service engineers would be out working with other customers I was the manager who was in doing the things necessary to insulate them from corporate politics giving them the chance to do their jobs <laughs> and so I might be in that office alone and I always thought to myself when I went and what am I going to do if there's an emergency in here? So my motivation was to learn and get the information. I love information. I don't care whether it's negative. I'd rather have it than not. So this building is tipping. We didn't know what happened. The plane actually hit 18 floors above us on the other side of the building. But we didn't know. What it did is it blew a hole through the entire building, and I'll get to that. But the building kept tipping. There was a colleague of mine from our corporate office who was in to be part of the seminars because he had account responsibility for some of the people who were going to be in, so he was there to talk about pricing. I was going to do the seminars, run the laptop projector. That's right, blind people can do PowerPoint. <laughs> you guys think it's a site-oriented thing, and you're the only ones that can do it? Wrong. <laughs> I could even do it without the computer being plugged in and still have a lot of fun. But. <laughs> But in any case, we had it all set up to do. So David, my, David Frank, my colleague, was in my office with me. We were cr creating a list of all the people who were going to be at the seminars. We were doing that for the Port Authority people. We had some guests in our conference room. David and I were speculating about what was happening. I grew up in Southern California, and I learned early on, building moves, go stand in doorways, earthquakes, right? <laughs> 78 floors up in a non-bearing wall, being in the doorway wasn't going to make a big difference. But hey, you know, that's what I learned to do, and so I stood there. David and I actually said goodbye to each other because we thought that the building was going to take a 78 floor plunge to the street. We said goodbye and then the building started slowing. I was holding my breath. We thought it was going to break off but it stopped and then it started coming back the other way. And it finally got to be vertical again. As soon as it was vertical I went back into my office and I met my guide dog at the time, Roselle, coming out from under my desk. Roselle was a great guide dog. She was <clears throat> the most focused dog I have ever had. She came out from under the desk. She wasn't doing anything to, uh, to indicate that she was concerned about anything other than who woke me up. But I took her leash, I told her to heal, which meant to come around on my left side and sit like Africa is now doing. Roselle was just yawning and wagging her tail and not worried about anything. Suddenly the building dropped straight down about six feet. Now today, we know that that is exactly what it was supposed to do because in reality, the reason the building bent and didn't break off is that buildings like that are constructed with expansion joints to allow them to be buffeted in the winds or, like the Empire State Building in the 1940s, be struck by an airplane, although no one ever thought anyone would deliberately do it. So the building moved six feet down. That's because the expansion joints were going back to their normal configuration. As soon as that happened, David, who was holding on to my desk, he was born in the Bronx, he didn't know about earthquakes. <laughs> David, let, David let go of my desk, turned and looked out the window and just started shouting, Oh my God, Mike, there's fire and smoke and millions of pieces of burning paper falling outside our window. We've got to get out of here. We can't stay here. The whole front of the building was glass. He could see all of that. Of course, he couldn't see what was going on up above other than he saw fire and smoke and flames. And I could hear debris falling outside our windows. The building had tipped like it did. No question about getting out of the building, right? You didn't have to see to know that. But David was giving me additional information which I found invaluable. However, I had a different conclusion than David. I wasn't panicking, even with David's additional information. I said, David, slow down. We'll get out, but just don't worry about it. No, 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 we've got to get out of here right now. There's millions of pieces of burning paper falling outside the window. We can't stay here. I kept saying, slow down. <clears throat> and he kept saying that we had to get out. Our guests in our conference room screamed and were yelling, and they started moving toward our exit. And finally I got David to focus and said, David, get our guests to the stairs. Don't let them take the elevators because I knew that especially since there was fire and that fire could get into elevator shafts. If anyone was in the elevator cars going down and fire got into the shafts, that would be it. Why did I behave the way I did? Because I was observing something that David wasn't. He could have, although he may not have even drawn the right conclusion, but I, um, I was observing something that he wasn't. 
Namely, a dog sitting next to me, not in any way indicating any kind of fear. You know dogs and animals like that. You've read stories about animals who got their humans out of places just because they detected smoke and some sort of bad condition before the people did. I wasn't getting any of that from Roselle. So I knew that whatever was going on, although it could change in a minute, I knew that we could try to evacuate in an orderly way. That was simply a fact that I knew because I had the extra advantage of using my vision as a blind person. Something that everyone else could do, but they don't learn some of those techniques and some of those appropriate responses to situations. So we got our guest to the stairs. Meanwhile, I called my wife to let her know that something had happened and that we were going to be leaving long before the media got the story. Then we went to the stairs and started down. As we walked down the stairs, I was smelling an odor. I couldn't imagine what it was. It took me a couple of floors to realize I'm smelling what I smell every time I go to an airport and fly. And I observed to other people, I'm smelling the fumes from burning jet fuel. And they said, you're right. We must have been hit by an airplane. These are people who came from different floors, different offices, but we were now all walking down the stairs. We figured out what must have happened, although we had no idea of the true nature of the emergency. We walked down the stairs. We had people pass us who were burned, badly burned, but were able to walk. There were times that people near us on the stairs would stop and start to panic, and we would stop. We had one woman who said, I can't go on, I can't breathe, I can't do this, we're not going to make it out. Nine of us surrounded her and had a group hug right there on the stairs. Roselle gave her kisses, and I said, come on, you can do it. And other people said, yeah, look, you can do it. Let's just keep going down the stairs. You're okay. And we continued down the stairs. My friend David said, Mike, we're going to die. We're not going to make it out of here. And I just said, stop it, David. If Roselle and I can go down these stairs, so can you. And I deliberately snapped at him because I had to bring him out of his funk. And he told me later that snapping at him was the best thing that I could do. He then did something that I thought was incredible. He did it for me, but he was helping so many people going out of the building. David left where we were and walked a floor below me. And he said, I'm going to go down and I'll just holler up to you anything that I see on the stairs. So when I was on the 49th floor, he was down on 48 saying, hey, Mike, I'm on the 48th floor. Everything is okay here. Go on on down. And meanwhile, I'm walking down and he's walking down. I'm at the 47th floor. He would shout up, everything is good. Why was that so neat and so wonderful? I think it's one of the most remarkable things I heard about and saw with 9-11 that day. It's so remarkable because, yes, he was saying it for my benefit, um, and I was glad to have it, although it wouldn't have changed my demeanor. But what David was doing, which I was so pleased about and so happy about, was he was, in a sense, acting as a beacon for anyone who could hear him below or above him. Anyone could hear him, would know where he was, it was okay. People listened to him. People watched me as I went down the stairs and kept saying, good girl, Roselle, and I praised her. What a good job, good girl. Keep going forward down the stairs. Finally, I decided I was gonna see how many stairs we were gonna go down. My master's degree in physics gives me an esoteric, weird <laughs> thought process. And I'm sitting there going, how many stairs am I gonna go down? But I don't wanna count them all. I ought to be able to use my master's degree to figure this out pretty accurately without counting every single step. So I realized that we were going down 10 stairs, then we were making a 180 degree turn, going down nine stairs, and we got to the next floor. 45th floor, everything is good here. Forward, Roselle, good girl, going down 10 steps, left, left, down nine more stairs. David's at the 44th floor. Hey, this is where the Port Authority cafeteria is. Not stopping, going on down. And I figured, ah, 19 stairs between floors. This is, this is good, okay. So I'm gonna have to go from 78 to 71. Gonna go down 78 floors. How many stairs does that mean I'm gonna, gonna actually pass? I'm gonna go down 77 different floors because I'm on 78, so 78 to 177 floors. 19 stairs between floors. 77 times 19 equals? <laughs> and no calculators. I didn't have one. 1,463 stairs. It's in the book. The book? We'll get to that. But um, 
I went, ah, 1463. And I also realized my master's degree in physics gave me this brilliant insight. Better to be going down than going up. <laughs> I like gravity. So we're going down the stairs. Along the way, we met the firefighters coming up. And they wanted to escort me down the stairs. And I didn't want that because they're a team. I didn't want to be responsible for breaking up their team. Now, I didn't know what was really going on. And they weren't saying... But I knew that I didn't need guidance to go down the stairs. I didn't need somebody grabbing me and lifting me up as we're getting to the first step, which is what people are prone to do. They don't want me to fall, but they'll lift me up and I'll lose my footing, but hello. <laughs> but the bottom line is, I didn't want to break up the, the team of first responders. And so we finally convinced them because I said I got my friend David who could see here and um, we're together. So they let us go and they went on up the stairs. The first guy who we met was discussing all this with me, and he was petting Roselle, which you don't do. Guide dog and harness, do not pet. Do not touch. Don't even talk to, by the way. <laughs> just keep that in mind. Guide dog and harness, do not interact with in any way, because the dog is working. Even though she's laying down here right now on the floor, and she might even fall asleep, because she's heard this. <laughs> She is prepared to work at a moment's notice. So dog and harness, do not touch. Because you'll interfere with her training and her discipline, such as it is with poor Africa. Um, Roselle was giving this guy kisses as he left. He was patting her, however. Probably the last unconditional love he ever got in his life. We went on down the stairs, finally got to the first floor and out into the lobby. Normally it's a very quiet scene, but now it was this chaotic scene. All the people who were there were shouting, go this way, go this way, all the, the people in charge. A guy came up to us and he introduced himself as being from the FBI and he was there to make sure we got out and I was sitting there going, FBI, I didn't do it, officer, whatever. But I, I, um, I said, well, what's going on? He said, well, there's no time to really go, we'll go into the details, just come this way. He took us, as everyone was being instructed to do, through into the central part of the World Trade Center, which in, on the first floor is a shopping mall. We ran through the shopping mall, finally up an escalator, and at 9.45 in the morning, an hour after the plane hit, we got outside. And that isn't the big part of the story. We got outside. We were told to leave the complex. David looked around and he said, Mike, I see fire in Tower 2. I said, what do you mean you see fire in Tower 2? He said, it's on fire too. I said, what the heck is going on? You know, we didn't hear an airplane hit it. And David said, no. You know, so we kind of thought of everything from another plane hit it, we just didn't know it, to maybe when our building tipped, it was tipping toward Tower 2, maybe the fire jumped across, we didn't know. Nevertheless, we went over to Broadway and walked north on Broadway, leaving the area. <clears throat> it eventually took us to a street that put us diagonally right across from Tower 2. Tower 2, like Tower 1, is 110 stories tall. That's over 400 yards, four football fields tall. David stopped at Ann Street, which put us diagonally across from Tower 2. He wanted to take some pictures of the fire that he could see in the tower, because we could see it pretty clearly now, or he could. We stopped. I tried to call my wife on the phone. I couldn't get through. The circuits were busy. Of course, people were saying goodbye to all their loved ones. I had just put my phone away, and David was putting his camera away when a police officer shouted, Get out of here! It's coming down now! Get out of here! And we heard this rumble that turned into this deafening roar. <coughs> We knew that it was Tower 2 right in front of us collapsing. I knew it. Other people could see it. The sound was like a freight train in a waterfall mix. You could hear metal clattering and crashing and clinking. You could hear glass breaking and tinkling. And then this white noise sound of the building just pancaking down. Everyone turned and ran. David ran. He was gone. I turned 180 degrees and started running back the way I came. And I remember the first thing I thought as I turned and ran was, God, I can't believe that you got us out of a building just to have it fall on us. Now, God and I have a pretty good relationship, I want you to know, <laughs> because I, I believe in talking with God. I don't do a lot of prayers, just give me this and that's it. You know, I look for responses and listen. So I believe in conversations. I said that, I think that was my closest time to panic. But as soon as I said those words to myself, I remember hearing in my mind a voice that said, as clearly as you hear me, don't worry about the things that you can't control. Focus on running with Roselle and the rest will take care of itself. And I suddenly had this feeling of conviction that if we work together, we really would be okay. 
We ran, we got to the next street, which was Fulton Street. I turned right on Fulton. We started running again, and then I caught up to David because David had stopped and realized that he had just run off. He wanted to come back and find me, but before he could do that, we caught up. And so he was apologizing, and I said, David, don't worry about it. Let's just go on. And we did. We started running. Then we got engulfed in the dust cloud. All the fine particles of Tower 2's breakup. It, the dirt and the dust were so thick that you couldn't see your hand, according to David, six inches in front of your face. I can tell you that it was so thick that with every breath I took, I could feel it going down my throat into my lungs. All that stuff. We were suffocating and we knew we had to get out of it. So as we were running, I told Roselle, right, right. I don't know whether she could see my hand signals or even hear my voice over all the noise, but I was also listening because I can hear when I come to an entrance to a building. Try it sometime. Walk down a hall with an open doorway. Close your eyes and if there's any kind of noise at all, you can actually tell the difference if you learn to do it. Little handy thing. Anyway, we ran. Suddenly I heard an opening and obviously Roselle did see it and knew what I wanted. She turned right, she took one step and she stopped and she wouldn't move. Focus on running with Roselle. We had stopped. Work with her will be okay. I knew that she must have stopped for a reason because she wasn't shaking, she just planted her feet. So upon investigation, I discovered we were at the top of a flight of stairs. She had done her job perfectly and stopped keeping us safe. We walked down the stairs into the Fulton Street subway station and stayed there with some other people in an employee locker room. A guy named Lou from the subway station found us and others and took us to the locker room. Then a police officer came and said, you need to leave the area now. Without waiting for a response, he turned, expecting all of us to follow him, which we did. We walked back through the subway station, up the stairs, through the little arcade where we had first come down, up two more sets of stairs into the outside. The air was a little better, but there was a lot of dust. We looked around. David said, oh my God, there's no Tower 2 anymore. I said, David, what do you see? And he said, all I see are pillars of smoke. It's gone. We just turned after a few minutes in shock and just walked away continuing to leave the area. We went about a quarter of a mile and we found ourselves in this little plaza area when suddenly we heard that freight train waterfall sound again and we knew it was our building collapsing. We thought we were far enough away that we wouldn't be hit by any debris, but we did see David saw another dust cloud coming, so we moved to the side to get out of the way of most of it. We hunkered down, we closed our eyes, covered our faces, and waited until everything stopped and died down. Then we stood up. David looked around and he said, oh my God, Mike, there's no World Trade Center anymore. I asked him again, what did you see? What do you see? And he said, all I see are pillars of smoke and fingers of fire shooting hundreds of feet into the air. It's gone. To think that three hours before, I had gone into the building just to do what I was supposed to do and mind my own business and doing my job, and then in the blink of an eye, it was gone. I waited a couple of minutes to try to kind of make sense of it. Then I called my wife, Karen. She's the first one who told us how Two aircraft had deliberately been flown by terrorists into the towers, one into the Pentagon, and a fourth was still missing over Pennsylvania. Spent the rest of the day walking up toward Midtown Manhattan, got a ride part of the way, stayed with a friend of David's for a while, and then I learned that the trains were running, so I went back to New Jersey. And finally at seven o'clock that night, I made it back to Westfield, New Jersey, where we lived, got off the train, and Karen and a friend had come to, to pick me up. I heard our van pull in the parking lot. Tom Painter, actually a friend of Karen's from high school, who also now lived in, or at that time lived in New Jersey, he still does, came down as soon as he heard about the towers, not knowing whether I was in or out of the buildings, but was there to support us. And Tom drove Karen to the station. I've got to stop very quickly and say, um, earlier this year, Karen had an illness double pneumonia, was very critically ill, and Tom came out from New Jersey in March to help us and is actually still with us. We've remained good friends and he's been a very supportive person and he had an illness a few years ago. We supported him as well. That is the way it ought to be. We all need to find ways to be supportive and to understand each other. And Tom did that for us and still does which is as cool as it gets. I don't know that there's any way to make sense out of 9-11. Yes, it was a tragedy. 
afterward, the media heard about my story and we got requests to do things like even be interviewed on Larry King Live. I learned that Roselle was a camera hound ham. <laughs> Don't have time to tell you the stories. She is a, was a nut. She died in 2011. She was a nut. And um, loved the camera. Loved Larry. And, um, you know, out of all of that, people started saying to me, would you come and tell us your story? Would you come and teach us lessons from 9-11? Because as I said earlier, 9-11, like any change, may not be something that we control. And we shouldn't worry about the things that we can't control. But we should focus on the things that we can, like how do we deal with the change? That's the real issue. That's what we can learn from something like 9-11. We can overcome change. We can always find ways to move forward from things that happen to us. We may not like or expect the change, but we can learn if we choose to, to move on from it. So people started calling me and saying, would you come and teach these lessons? Now, my whole life has been in sales. There's nothing better than somebody calling up a sales guy and saying, we'll pay you just to come and talk to us. <laughs> That's as good as it gets. <laughs> of course, the burden is saying relevant things and all that, but that's okay. But for a sales guy, a sales manager and all that, that's really as good as it gets. So it is what I do for a living. So all of you sponsors who are here tonight who are with companies, all you retired people who know people at Boeing, um, other things like that, if anyone needs a speaker, we're available. Uh, <clears throat> you know, what can I say? Someone's got to sell. Um, also, to, to in, in, all, in all seriousness, but those are lessons to be learned. I wrote a book about it called Thunderdog. I wrote it with a woman named Susie Flory. Thunderdog, the story of a blind man, a guide dog, and the triumph of trust. It was published in August of 2011 and has been a number one New York Times bestseller. And we have copies of it for sale out in the, in the, the lobby, the hallway. Africa says, please buy them so that we can buy kibbles for her tomorrow. <laughs> so. We really, we really hope that, uh, that you'll support Africa and you can learn from it. We also just recently published a, a children's book and it's available, it's called Running with Roselle. I, I gotta tell you, more adults are buying it than kids. But it, it also isn't so much the 9-11 story. Both of them are about perseverance. Both of them are about teamwork and moving on. We'll autograph all the books. Actually, the Thunderdog books are autographed and we'll autograph the Running with Roselle books because I didn't get a chance to do it before leaving home. We also have audio copies of Thunderdog. Um, and just to tell you, the print Thunderdogs are $16.95, the audios are $19.95, and the Running with Roselle books are $9.95 and we'll take credit cards, checks, cash, um, but not your firstborn child. <laughs> but it, but it, is, it is about dealing with change. It is about learning that all of us have gifts. Special Education Foundation and Character Plus are all about bringing out those gifts in kids. And hopefully that means bringing out those gifts more in us as adults too. So all I can say is let's work together and help the good guys win and just make this a better society. Thanks very much. Standing O. Wow. Especially from a Dodgers fan. <laughs> Michael. You didn't know we had it in us, did you? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for a very special evening. And uh, thank you again for the invitation. Thank you, everybody, for our wonderful sponsors and uh, for all of you being here tonight. Um, I think we still have time to mingle and talk. I know some of you probably have questions or comments for Michael. And the book will be available outside, as they say. Please buy in bulk. So thank you very much. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you, Michael. <laughs>